Heavenly Father, we thank you for the night's rest that you've given us all. We thank you for another day of life that we can come to know you better and serve you. Uh, we thank you for the nice day that you've given us. We ask for your presence today um, at this hour. Please send your Holy Spirit and your angels uh, to abide with us. Teach us things that we do not know that we need to know. Open our ears to hear your voice uh, when you do speak. We ask that, uh, as Brother Russell shares with us this morning, that you would uh, anoint his mind and his words and let what is spoken be for your gl glory and honor. And we thank you for bringing us here together at this time to um, dig deep into your word. And we ask that you bless this time, this uh, encampment uh, mightily, that it would change each and every one of us mm -hmm. to be more like you as we um, end the meeting and go back home to share what we're in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Some of us, I, to some of us, um, for perhaps about 75% 75, 75 of what I am about to present this morning, you have heard because I presented it at the church um, Sabbath gone. Um, I was under the impression that everyone would have been at, there at my first presentation because I needed um, vital points from this presentation for the next um, three presentations. So I am going to repeat it again, um, perhaps with a little uh, more clarity than Sabbath, because I realized that some people weren't following some of the things I was saying. So I will attempt to um, clarify some of those points as I move along. I'd like you, first of all, to turn with me with to um, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 22. We'll read the parable of the invitation to the wedding I'm sure most of us are familiar with. It will be upon this platform that this presentation is base, will be base. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by, par by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner and my oxen, and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he, went forth, he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burnt up their cities. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden, were, they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. If you will turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. And we will view
verses 9 and 10. Sorry. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show unto thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And I'm white in a statement from the Great Controversy, page 427. She says, in the parable, when the bridegroom came, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. The coming of the bridegroom here brought to view takes place before the marriage. Before the marriage. The marriage represents the, the reception of Christ, sorry, the reception by Christ of his kingdom, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, which is the capital and representative of the kingdom. It is called the bride, the lamb's wife. Said the angel to John, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Um, clearly that the bride here represents New Jerusalem. If you will go with me to Daniel chapter 7. Beginning from verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne as, sorry, was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fire stream issued and came forth from before him, Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. If you'll drop down with me to verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom. Um, it is clear here that this is describing the, the beginning of the marriage ceremony where Christ is to receive his kingdom, of which the capital will be New Jerusalem, his bride. In the wedding, depicted in the parable, we notice that an invitation went forth to the entire world, including the Jewish nation, after the Jewish nation was rejected as the Israel of God. The invitation went into the whole world, and Jesus says to go and gather all that would, lead, that would come to the wedding, both bad and good. And the, and the, and the wedding was indeed furnished with guests. It is important for us to understand the events leading up to the beginning of this wedding, the events leading up to the opening of the judgment. The judgment, as we see in the parable, is brought to view. If you will go back to me, go back with me to Matthew chapter 23, 22. In the judgment, the king comes in to see the guests. We see that in verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. So the events leading up to the beginning of this wedding reception, there is an investigation that takes, that takes place. Um, and we want to consider those events leading up to the opening of the judgment. 
I want you to turn with me to um, sorry, Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, verse 1, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roared. And when he had cried, seven thunders had uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the, which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. This angel that comes down with the little book, containing this little book, are the very information that we want to examine at this point in time, the events that lead up, the events that lead up to the opening of this judgment. It is my intention to, uh, this morning to make clear those events that were contained in the little book, or is or contained in the little book. And I want to do so by examining events surrounding 1840. 1840 is a very crucial point in the experience of the Millerites when this angel descends with the little book open. Now, Ellen White referring to that point in time, she says the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message to lighten the whole earth with his glory, a work of worldwide and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent Movement of 1840 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world, and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has, which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third, angels, of the third angel. The Advent Movement of 1840, she says, was a manifestation of the power of God. This manifestation is symbolized by the angel descending with the little book open in his hand. This manifestation she compares with the angel, with the angel of Revelation 18 at the end of the world. So it is important for us to understand the contents of this little book, as this little book is what this manifestation of power is all about. In, um, also, in 1840, I want to examine another point. I want to take you to Revelation chapter 17. And, and if you will follow my mouse pointer, I should have said so earlier on, um, but you may have noticed it, that this portion of the, of the slide here where the mouse pointer is represents the, the angel descending with the little book. We want to now examine this portion of the slide here which deals with Revelation 17. Revelation 17, if you will go with me to Revelation 17. And remembering that this is a prophecy school and it's not meant to be a sermon, so it's, you'll find that I am treating this like, like a class. Set. The mindset is we are trying to learn something here rather than being um, sermonized. So bear with me as I may seem a little bit orthodox. Um, Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great hall that sitteth upon many waters. He brings to view the judgment. He brings to view 
1844, he brings to view the, invita the invitation to the marriage. The little whore that sits upon many waters, and the waters we know represents peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Revelation 17, verse 15. I want you to go with me to Reve Daniel chapter 7 and hold on to Revelation 17. And Daniel 7, Daniel 7, Remember, we identified the judgment where the books were open in verse 9 and 10. And verse 11 of Daniel chapter, chapter 7 brings to view the little horn or the whore in the judgment. I behold then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. He sees the whore in the judgment. And he sees the reason, and he understands the reason for her judgment is because of the words that she spake. Her words led multitudes to be in opposition to Christ Jesus. Um, I want you to go back with me to Revelation chapter 17, and as he's unfolding the mystery surrounding this woman, in the judgment. Go back with me to verse 3. Drop down with me to verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Notice that this woman sits upon this beast with seven heads. This beast has seven heads. Concerning the heads, if you will drop down with me to verse 9. And here is a man which had wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. John is being told that the seven heads are seven mountains, and seven kings. There are seven kings. The seven kings here represents, re represented uh, Babylon, Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, the United States of America, the lamb-like beast, and the new world order. Seven heads that will carry the woman through our time. At, this, at the point in time when, when John is brought into the wilderness, the woman is sitting upon the fifth head of the beast. Verse 3 again reading it. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. The wilderness here brought to view is the time period of, of, of the 1260 reign, papal reign of supremacy. John is brought to, to, to this point in time where he sees the woman riding the beast. If you will drop down with me to verse 6. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And, with, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Verse 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which had the seven heads and the ten horns. Remember, the government of that beast at that point in time was in the, the, the fifth beast of Revelation 13 and 17. It's the same beast. Now, the angel is telling John that there is a mystery surrounding the woman and the beast. And it is his intention to open up this mystery to John. He begins in verse 8, he says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. The beast that was, before 1798, this beast was carrying a woman. 
at the point in time where John was standing, he no longer sees this beast carrying the woman. So it's written in the past tense. The beast that was, is not, where John is standing, shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Future. Um, but following this, the ending of verse 8, John says, the, be the beast yet is. Yet is. I want you to take your mind back to the invitation that um, Christ told his, his disciples to go into all the world and call both bad and good to the wedding, re to the wedding reception. In this invitation, remember that the Jewish nation in AD 34 had, had um, you know, exhausted the, the, the grace of God. They had, they had, they had frustrated um, the heavenly host, and therefore they, the heavenly host had, had decreed upon them, the judgment was set upon them, that they will bypass as the Israel of God. Michael stood up after the stoning, sto the stoning of Stephen. And the, 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 the gospel went to the Gentile world. The invitation went to the Gentile world to call them to the wedding. To a great degree, paganism was, over, was, was, being, was being overturned by the, by the gospel. Then the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians cites the mystery of iniquity as paganism was transforming itself into Christianity when Constantine walked into the church. And, how this, and then... We understand that the ceremonies of hedonism took over the church. Um, from there on, the man of sin began to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And in so doing, he, he himself sent out an invitation to the wedding, to a wedding, but not, it was not the wedding of Christ and his bride, but rather Satan and his bride. As you see the parallel in the two invitations, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, as, this, as the invitation is going out. And as we come to the time period of 1798, where John is in Revelation 17, the invitation that the beast had sent out, the woman had sent out, had reached its conclusion, had accomplished its work. And therefore, it was time for the woman to assume a new guise. In fact, this was the whole point of her invitation. Her doctrines had placed her in the hearts of Christianity. They had not recognized that this was so, in that they were carrying the doctrines of Rome, sun worship, infant baptism. Many hidden customs were in the church, even though they had, even though they had protested against her and came out. But to a great degree, the woman was still being carried by the two classes of worshippers. John sees in Revelation chapter 13, if you will go there with me to Revelation chapter 13. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This beast is to exercise all the power of the first beast before him and to cause the whole world to worship the first beast. This beast is carrying the woman at this point. And this is what is illustrated by this point of the slide, this beast rising from 1798 as she's carrying the woman. Now, this is the purpose, this is the reason for the angel of Revelation 10 descending. He's descending as the two classes of worshippers who had heeded the invitation were, were, at, or were on their journey to the, to the marriage ceremony. Remembering that the marriage takes place, begin, the beginning of the marriage takes place in 1844. It starts in 1844, and it's a progression. 
I want to now examine another part of the Revelation, and I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any, any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. This angel also, this angel also is connected with the events of 1840. This sealing angel, as he com comes in and he instructs four angels who were given the power to hurt the earth, to restrain them from, 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 from doing so, that the servants of God would be sealed. The purpose of the sealing, remember, the sealing also is a, is, is a form of cleansing. Christ is cleansing. His intention is to cleanse out of us everything that defiles his temple, that his spirit and what he is may be sealed in us. Remember that the two classes of worshipers is depicted as ascending. And they're ascending, and they, they're ascending towards the marriage. And the marriage, um, in the marriage, ceremony, remember that Jesus described a character that had not the wedding garment as a judge came in to examine the guests. I want to focus on an aspect of Revelation 7 in regard to the four angels whom, whom power was given to hurt the earth and the sea. In order to do so, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, its focus is, is centered around the rise of Islam. And this is the prophecy that Josiah Lynch, the pioneers, had studied and predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire, reaching up to 1840. Remember that this brought a power into the Advent movement. In examining this portion of the, of the scriptures, I want you to turn with me to verse 4 of the chapter in regards to the power that is ascending out of the bottomless pit. And it says, and it was commanded them that they should not, hurt the, the, should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green tree, neither any green thing, sorry, neither any, any tree, but only those men which had not the seal of God in their foreheads. I want you to, I want you to go with me to verse 11 concerning this very same power. It says, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue had his name Apollyon, or in simple terms, Satan was the angel that presided over that power that came from the bottomless pit. Verse 12 says, One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. In verse 13, verse 13 introduced the second woe, or the sixth trumpet. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now, if you notice that, if you notice that this power in verse 4, restraints was placed upon it. 
restraints that it was not permitted to hurt the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree. But now, the restraints are removed, and, and, and they are allowed to, they're allowed to slay the earth, or s slay the, 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 the inhabitants of the earth. Um, to be more precise, Eastern Rome is under attack by Islam. Islam, under the, under the fifth trumpet, um, was commanded not to hurt any green tree or any green thing or any, um, all the earth. But now the restraints is remo removed in, under, the sixth, under the sixth trumpet. I want to continue by telling you that the four angels here represented, according to the pioneers, are the four principal sultans that, that control the, the, the um, Ottoman Empire during the time period from 1449, from 1299, sorry, on to its destruction. The trumpets are similar to the plagues, and the trumpets are judgments of God against Rome. The first four trumpets were judgments upon Western Rome. This, the, the following two trumpets, which we are now examining, are judgments on Eastern Rome. In understanding that the plagues are also judgments upon Rome because of the Sunday law. And so, the setting of the plagues and the trumpets are similar. The winds that are blowing when the angel of Revelation 10 descends and the angel of Revel Revelation 7, the, or sorry, I should say the winds that were blowing was, was, was the sixth trumpet, the Islamic winds that was blowing across the globe as it conquered Eastern Rome and, it, and, and its intention was to, exp to spread its false light over to the western side of Rome. But the angel descends, and he descends with an urgency, and he says to the four angels, and if you will go with me to verse 7, chapter, sorry, chapter 7 of Revelation, the angel descend, and in verse 3 he says, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. A sealing process is necessary as the two classes, I will point to you to this, if you follow the mouse pointer, a sealing process is necessary as the two classes, one class, well both classes ignorantly are carrying the woman. They're carrying the invitation of the woman. That, that is riding upon this beast that is, that is ascending out of the earth. But there is a class also, they, but in their, in their experience, in their mindset, they believe that they, they're hidden to the invitation of Christ. But Christ can tell that it's, it is only one class that is sincere. The other class is moving from impulse as he's responding to this invitation. He's moving without a thorough understanding of the word of God for that time. Remembering, now we, we are at 1840 and we, we realize these um, movements that John is, is, is being told in relationship to the, to, to the, to the wedding um, converging in 1840 and an event of sealing is necessary. And so the angel of Revelation 10, as he descends with this little book, and this little book, Ellen White refers to, in Second Selected Messages, page 104, she says, the book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel which related to the last days. The scripture says, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made, time shall be no longer. The book of Daniel is now unsealed, and the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth by the increase of knowledge a people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. She says the book of Daniel was unsealed 
when the proclamation was made in Revelation 10, 6, time shall be no longer. If you will. Bear with me. Another statement, several Bible countries, page 971, paragraph 3, she said, after these seven thunders uttered their voices, remember that the angel utters seven thunders from this little book. He, he opens to John the mysteries that was contained in the little book. After these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. She says, these relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. Dropping down to the highlighted red area, we read, the special light given to John which was expressed in the seven thunders was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. She says, it was a delineation of events that was to transpire under the first and second angel's messages. Um, remembering that um, the first angel's message, um, well, go with me to Revelation chapter 14, please. Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The everlasting gospel was first preached in Eden. And God's judgment was pronounced upon the serpent and the woman and Adam as a result, as a result of their transgression. And in, in Genesis chapter 3.15, the everlasting gospel, the first sermon preached, um, stated, I will put enmity between thy seed and the seed of the woman. Remember, the seed of the woman is Christ. And Christ was to come and to put enmity between Satan's disciples, between Satan's words and his words, as accepted by the classes of worshippers on the earth. And as we can identify in 1840, there are two classes. One class, well, both classes are carrying the woman, the woman that sit upon the scarlet colored beast. One class is carrying this woman um, by reason of, well, both classes are carrying this woman by reason of ignorance for one class, and another class is uncaring. It is, uh, this class is not interested really in salvation. It's, in, it's, it's about opportunities, this class. Um, quick results as Ellen White describes it in The Great Controversy. The whole point of the everlasting gospel is to bring enmity or to separate the two classes of worshipers. And remember that we read that the seven thunders was a delineation of events that were to transpire under the first and second angel's messages. And as we see the first angel's message, the everlasting gospel, and carrying on verse seven, it, sta it states, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, as the hour of judgment came in Genesis, where Christ pronounced the word of separation between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And there, the revelator continues, he says, And worship him that made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. I want to add to that, the revelator is saying, in other words, he's, he's saying, in other words, if any man worship the beast, or rather, the woman and the beast that carrieth her. This is the essence of the first and second angel's message. First angel's message is, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. The everlasting gospel is to separate two classes. Remember, one class Remember that the two classes are carrying this woman. Ignorantly, in, in both cases, but one class, 
one class is sincerely is sincere in her worship or its worship to Christ Jesus. So as the increase of knowledge come into the experience of the, of the two classes, one class does not comprehend the light. At that point in time, darkness proportioned to the light was now engulfing that class of worshippers, the foolish virgins. That class in whom the doctrines of Rome was predominant was now being engulfed by the darkness. The darkness, the very same darkness that is depicted by the angel from the bottomless pit, whose name is Abaddon. And the other class, as Ellen White described the angel of Revelation 10, a personage of Jesus, is now coming into a right relationship with Christ Jesus. And the two classes, the events are transpiring. These events are transpiring under the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages. As you see, the very wording of the first and second angel's messages is describing the very events that are transpiring under the two classes. Remembering that Ellen White stated, first, she stated that concerning the little book, she says, the unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. The message that was being proclaimed at that point in time was the first and second angel's message. Now, and this message, this message, as I, as I, as I pointed out to you, is identical to the events that are transpiring under it. And these events are unfolding in relation to time. And the, the unfolding of these, of, the, of, of these events are leading to a separation of the two classes. But these is, these are, this is exactly what the first and second angel's message is describing. So therefore, the unsealing of the little book was the sealing message in relation to time. The angel... And what is, the, what, is the, what is the purpose of the third angel's message or the first and second angel's message, which is the third angel's message? Ellen White says in early writings, page 118, she says, I didn't saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. These things should engross the whole mind and whole attention. So we see that the first and second angel's message is a sealing message. But the, the message containing the first and, first and second angel's message is identical to the unsealing of the little book. It is describing the events that are transpiring under it. What I want to draw your attention to concerning this little book, I want you to pay attention to... Um, well, first of all, go with me to... Daniel chapter, chapter 11. And in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, Daniel brings you to the precise point in time where John in Revelation 17 says, the beast that thou sawest was... And the events, the first part of Daniel 11, verse 40, it deals with the events that led to that, that, that position. Verse 40 states, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. The king of the south we know to be um, atheistic France, as she inflicted a deadly wound upon the papacy in 1798. At that point in time, the beast that John saw was is not. Now, what followed the first part of verse 40 was Revelation chapter 11, verse 11. Chapter, chapter, sorry, chapter 13, verse 11, where John sees the beast, a new beast, the lamb-like beast, ascending out of the bottomless pit. Out of the earth, sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to pay attention to this, to the slide. If you notice that this portion here begins with 1798. And notice that we have just described the events that led all the way to 1844. 
these events we just identify in verse 40 of Daniel 11, beginning in verse 40 of Daniel 11. If you, if you will think about this, you will realize that the events of, from 1798 to 1844 are contained in the little book of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Why am I saying that? If you pay attention to the, to the second part of verse 40, we read, And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the, to the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Between those two parts of verse 40 lies the event of 1840 to 1844. But if you notice that the events of 1840 to 1844 are connected with the events of 1798 as this new beast is ascending. So the events that are transpiring in the little book of 40 to 45 is vital to our sealing at the end of the world. As we can see, it is the little book of 40 to 45 that was sealed and now is being opened up. We were just examining a small portion of it between 1840 to 1844, the events that transpired there. In fact, it is the events that transpired there that led to the events of 1989. In 1844, Rome accomplished a moral defeat over the churches of Babylon, the churches that rejected the message. And as a result of that, this is the reason for Rome, for the for United States of America returning with Rome beginning in 1989. I want you to notice that it was atheism in 1798 that resulted in a change of heads, where the woman was moving from the fifth head to the sixth head, which was carrying her to the judgment. I want you to notice in 1989, it is atheism again that is causing the change from the sixth head to the seventh head as this woman is being carried again to the close of the judgment by this beast, the seventh head. It is important to understand the mysteries that are contained in the little book. In fact, I want you to go with me to Daniel chapter, sorry, Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7. And we read, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mysteries of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants, the prophet. Well, the mysteries of the little book will be finished. Because remember that in Revelation 10.6, she says, Ellen White quotes Revelation 10.6, and she says, the book of Daniel is now on seal. So the, to the seven thunders, which John heard, John heard the mysteries, which was, which was, which was sounded in the seven thunders, um, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that mystery would be on seal. And when the proclamation was made, time shall be no more, and the one says the book of Daniel is now on seal. The mystery of Christ sealed within. As we can see, this is the whole purpose of the angel descending with the little book in 1840. The sealing of Christ in the five wise virgins and the mystery of the woman and the beast that carried her. All of these, these three mysteries were opened by the understanding of the little book in the time period of 1844, the time of the end. It is important, brethren, as we come to the final close of this earth's history, which is which has already began, the events have already began, 1989 has began again, the very events that began in 1798. We see a, change, a changing of heads 
are in, the, uh, are in the making. And the woman is now ascending again, the back of the beast. This time, she is heading for the complete victory. In 1844, she accomplished a moral victory, a partial victory. At the Sunday law in the United States of America, and the Sunday law in the world, she will, she will accomplish a complete victory. It is essential to our salvation that we understand the mysteries contained in the little book. As Ellen White says, the unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. The message was the sealing message. So I add to it, the unsealing of the little book was the sealing message in relation to time. I'd like to close at this point. Or do I still have time? Do I still have time? Five minutes, okay. Um, no, I'll close at this point. Close at this point. <laughs> I might get into, um, okay. Um, No, I'll leave it. I'll leave it for later. I'll leave it for later. Okay. We'll close at this point because um, I would not want to get into something which I couldn't finish within the five minutes. So, um, shall we bow our heads for prayer? Okay. Shall we kneel? <laughs> Dear Father God, we thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you for this camp meeting. We thank you, Lord, for the motivation and, and Lord, your spirit that have moved the many who have come here. We pray, O oh Lord, that the blessing, Lord, that you have in store for us, Lord, we will all receive it. And that, Lord, we will open our, you will open our understanding to these things which are vital, Lord, to our salvation, upon whom, Lord, the end of the world has come. Lord, help us, I pray, at this time to contemplate on these things, Lord, and not be as the foolish virgins who were satisfied with a flickering light of good emotions, Lord. Help us, I pray, to be thoroughly grounded in these truths, for by the increase of knowledge, our people are to be prepared to stand. We pray that you will be with the rest of today's proceedings in a mighty and special way. We ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen.